Okay. Cool. So I think we're going to get started because it is one and it's very packed. So we're just going hit to right, hit it right off. I'm not going to talk for very long. Um, you don't have to stay for the whole time if you don't want to. Each section kind of has slightly different things that they require, especially biochem. Yours is special. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you got a little extra requirements. Um, but yeah, so our graduate student panel is going to be at the very end. So if you do need to leave in the middle, for, feel free to come back. Um, we don't have an inorganic representative. Sorry, um, no one volunteered. Um, but yeah, so we'll start off with Dr. Laskin. Do you want the clicker? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, cool. It sure. should actually wait, I didn't turn on. Sorry. There we go. Okay. All right. It should okay. be good to go. Okay. All right. Hello. Hopefully you're all excited about your OP uh, coming up. So it's really an exciting time, somewhat stressful, right? But uh, hopefully, oh, that's me apparently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are in this photo, so welcome. Uh, all right. So let me talk about uh, OP in the analytical division. What are we looking for and uh, how, how to approach it, in my opinion? So, um, so what you have to demonstrate, what's the goal, is uh, that you can, uh, you demonstrate that you can be an independent scientist by learning from a different field. And uh, what you will do, you will critically evaluate the, the, uh, that field or like some, some subfield, of course, identify knowledge gaps in that field, uh, come up with an idea, how do you address that knowledge gap, and uh, um, design an experiment or simulation or whatever you, you want to do, a computational approach that will address that knowledge gap. And uh, you will demonstrate that you're able to communicate your idea clearly to your committee, both in writing and in your presentation. So you will be presenting in front of your small committee. There will be three people evaluating you uh, during your OP. So keep in mind that this is a friendly uh, group of curious scientists. We're not trying to fail you by any means, but if you're telling us something, a lot of questions will be driven by just curiosity or trying to understand what you're telling us, okay? So, so basically, you need to understand very well what you're telling us in order for you to explain to us what is that that you're trying to convey. Uh, so the passing rate for OPs is high, you probably know that, but it's because our students do put a lot of effort into that too. So, so that's why you succeed. So you can't just take it to that, oh, I'll pass it no matter what. No, you will not pass it no matter what. Uh, so again, most of the questions will be driven by our desire to understand what you're saying. And uh, you should be able to defend everything that's in your written and uh, in your written uh, proposal and in your slides during your presentation, oral presentation. So if you're selecting 10 techniques to address a knowledge gap in a certain field, you should know how each of those 10 techniques works and what's the limitations and what are the challenges of those techniques. So my recommendation is do not take 10 techniques, okay? Don't do that, don't overload your stuff. Uh, now, um, just before I forget to say that, if you do not pass your OP at the, in your first attempt, this is not the end of the world, okay? Most of those no passes are conditional. So you will be given some kind of assignment to provide some additional information. So don't feel that you failed, that this is so terrible. Don't let yourself down, uh, you know, Things happen, things like that happen, but you get an opportunity to, for a rebuttal, okay? And so that's what we do in science. We just, we receive a letter and we uh, respond to it, right? All right, so where to start? I would go to some major review articles in recent journals. So annual, uh, annual reviews of analytical chemistry. The very first issue of the year of analytical chemistry has a bunch of really relatively concise reviews. That's your great source of uh, starting point. Uh, some other uh, good review journals, but if you go to chem reviews, you'll have to read a very long review. So I would recommend to go for shorter reviews that will get you through those uh, different topics more quickly so that you can evaluate them. So find a topic that interests you, identify gaps, propose a solution, and make sure this has not been done, okay? Uh, and know how to articulate what has been done and what has not been done in the field. 
for focus on chemistry and analytical chemistry for analytical chemistry students okay so don't take you know some weird computational challenge or weird you know uh, somewhere in mechanical engineering challenge or whatever focus on chemistry okay this is it's it's much more appropriate well you will also learn in the field that's related to your phd um so uh, make sure to select a topic that's far enough from your area of uh, expertise and research okay what does that mean the closer you are to your area of research the more scrutiny is on the uh, on the ideas that you propose. So uh, just the, uh, you know, uh, novelty versus uh, kind of, you know, your novelty and innovation ratio uh, kind of uh, uh, criterion changes depending on how far close you are to your area of uh, uh, expertise. So here, are some, here is just a tentative structure of the proposal. I'm not gonna read through that. Uh, you hopefully can, uh, will they get a copy of the slides? So get a copy of the slides so you don't have to read through this. Uh, objectives, background, significance, specific aims, approach, uh, summary and references, and roughly what I think is a ballpark of a good kind of length of each section. Can be longer, it can be somewhat shorter, so this is not like a, 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 an exact recipe, okay? But just a tentative structure. All right, so during your uh, exam, uh, you uh, will have to prepare slides for about 20 to 30 minutes of presentation without interruptions. And you have to be ready to be interrupted. So in uh, analytical, we ask questions as we go. Uh, so that means that usually this 20, 30 minutes will be about an hour or so. So it's good to like be done at an, uh, after about an hour, right? So that's roughly the expectation. Uh, use figures from literature to support your idea. Use your own calculations if you decide to. Do some uh, calculations, simulations. Do not make up data, okay? Don't come up with something that does not exist. Uh, be ready to defend everything you show in your slides and uh, uh, have uh, backup slides for, for in anticipation for questions. So here are the key points that you need to uh, include. You need to give a background, keep it short, uh, articulate your novelty early on, the novelty of your idea, articulate it as early as possible in your presentation. Uh, then propose experiments you will perform. Uh, what do you do first? What do you do next? So uh, uh, do that, go through that, and uh, explain the outcome of your proposal. You will usually have uh, significant aims in your proposal. It's uh, Three is a good number. It can be four, it can be two. Uh, three is usually a good number. Try to make sure your, your uh, specific aims are not uh, daisy-chained, okay? So that if the first one fails, your entire idea fails, right? So let yourself an opportunity to stand up on your feet and your second aim if your committee doesn't think that your first aim will work, right? So don't, don't daisy-chain them. Keep them as independent as possible. They can be uh, interconnected, but they don't have to be like, just think about if the first idea fails, will the second one stand still on its own feet, okay? So that gives you that uh, extra kind of cushion for, to, to fall back on one of your ideas, okay? And uh, uh, you may be asked to talk about your research. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't do it. But just have, you know, uh, slides prepared for about uh, five to ten minutes, again, without interruptions, uh, summary of your research. Sometimes you will be asked. Sometimes you won't be asked, so it doesn't mean anything whether or not you're asked, okay? It just usually means how, like, whether your committee members are pressed on time and need to leave, you know, that's one. Okay, so that's the OP exam, and here is just a, a very brief list of do's and do don'ts. So ask your senior graduate students for advice on both topic and on the slides and the, on pretty much everything. Uh, practice your talk with the group. They, they are your best resource for questions. They will challenge you, and uh, they will also tell you how to polish your slides. Uh, make sure that you have a good grasp of the field. Make sure that you explain everything in the slides. Make sure that, you, that your figures are of good quality, okay? Just think about your, your committee. We're a, a little bit older than you, just a tiny bit, right? Mm -hmm. So our eyesight is not as good as, as yours, you know, and we get annoyed easily when the font sizes are not legible in the slides. So one thing to kind of, you know, not 
to, to consider just to make sure your committee members are happy to see what you're showing. Um, uh, make sure that the graphics, are, uh, okay, that's, that's what I said, the fonts are easy to read and uh, rest before a presentation, okay? Don't do, uh, uh, don't prepare last night before the presentation. Make sure that you're in a good like, spirit for that. Uh, do not leave everything until the last moment. Don't overcomplicate your idea. Just keep it simple. Uh, don't overload your slides. Keep them also legible, simple, and easy to follow. Uh, don't propose too many things to do or too many techniques to use. You'll have to defend every single one of them. And don't make up data. So that's all I had to say. Hopefully I left a few minutes for questions. Yeah, we have about like five minutes for questions and plenty of time. Okay, I'm just going to fix something while we're <laughs> taking questions. That's true. <laughs> so yeah, and scheduling will be quite challenging, so just take into consideration all of you will want to push this towards the deadline, and that's when all of your committee members will be unavailable, just unavailable, okay? We'll all teach, we'll all travel, we'll do other things, and so just, you know, the, the sooner you schedule the better, the earlier you do your OP, the better the easier it is to schedule. Okay, what other questions do you guys have? How many pages for the document? How many pages for the document? Yes. Uh, I think I don't remember the, <laughs> the total. And again, this is a tentative, right? So, um, I don't know, probably five-ish pages, six, I don't know. We don't have a, a page limit on that. So if you think about a good, uh, like, NIH proposal for, like, a smaller grant, which is R21 proposal, is about six pages in the narrative, it's six pages, and one page of specific aims. So if you are at about somewhere there, you're writing pretty much a, a good proposal, you know, for that could get you funded. So about six pages of narrative is probably the best target, and then references do not count against that. But we don't have a page limit, right? Yes. Um, for the document, should figures be formatted with the text, or can we do like full page plates at the end of the proposal? It's best to insert figures on the, on the page, right? right? It's, it's just even when you write papers, it's best to have figures inserted because people like to see your figure as they read your narrative. For reference, without figures, mine was about 10 pages, so I went a little over. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't have a page mm -hmm. limit, or, but my, my recommendation would be, you know, six pages of narrative, maybe one page of specific things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you can get hold of your uh, uh, group's proposals from your PI, this, this is probably the best kind of example of how to write a proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, how, how is it framed? So just ask for a copy of an NIH or NSF proposal, and you should be, you will have a good example of what's a good, what does a good proposal look like? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have one more minute, or we can. Start the next one early. <laughs> Thank you so much, by the way, for being here. These are all they're all volunteering, by the way. This isn't something they have to do. So we really appreciate <laughs> you guys being here. Well, cool. Yeah, so up next we have Dr. Burt. So it should be the bottom of this one. Oh, yeah. oh, you know, I have other things to say. Hers is very helpful. Just in organic. Hers is very helpful. She's the one who made the little do's and don't cheat. It's like when I go to conferences. When it's like <laughs> no. it's like when I don't actually. Oh, good. Okay. Um, all right, so first I want to thank Sam and ISP for setting up this session. Um, if you're not in ISP um, and you identify as a female, you should think about joining it. Um, so as Sam mentioned, I'm here for the inorganic division, but I have some more general advice too. How many of you are in inorganic or materials or have an inorganic professor on their committee? 
Okay, one person <laughs> right here, thanks. <laughs> all right, um, so, all right, so I'll just uh, get started. So I have this handout here, so it's not up there, it's over here. Um, all right, so in inorganic, we're one of those divisions where we tell you that what you propose for your OP should not be related to what your thesis project is. So that is the expectation of most um, inorganic professors. So in terms of things that you should do, um, choose a topic that interests and excites you. The idea being that when you write this proposal, it's going to be like kind of a fun, cool, scientific deep dive into an area. So you want to do something that you think um, is pretty neat. Um, I would ask your research advisor or check the grad student handbook um, for divisional guidelines. So Dr. Laskin just went over some of those. Um, for inorganic, I will say we do not have like a specific length, but generally we say 10 to 15 pages, double spaced. Um, and then of course, you know, you can add the figures. I personally hate it when people put figures at the end, so don't do that, just put them like in the text. Um, also, my advice is to come up with a few ideas that maybe are like somewhat related and research them simultaneously. So that like if one turns out to like not be very fruitful or if you figure out that somebody did it, like you're not completely like starting over from scratch. So um, try to research a few things simultaneously. And then please use figures liberally to make your report interesting and effective and hopefully not too long. Um, and please make sure that you reference them. Like it's fine to borrow figures from other papers, but you have to reference them and give credit. Um, the next one is a big one. It sounds kind of silly, but make sure you actually propose something. I have been in OPs where they read like a literature review, Betsy's nodding her head, like, and the student really means well, and they go through all of this depth, but it turns out by the end of the thing, like, they haven't actually proposed anything. So make sure there's some type of, like, actionable item. Like, you should be able to answer the question what is the first experiment you're going to do when you get the funding for this project? The fake imaginary funding that we're not going to give you. Um, you see what I mean? Like, make sure you have, like, something actionable that you can think about doing. Because most um, professors will ask you that. Like, what are you going to actually do? So make sure that there's actually, like, a specific proposal. And like Dr. Laskin said, if you want to put, like, specific aims or project objectives or something, like, in the beginning of your report, like, that's fine, and that will help you sort of um, get those ideas across. Definitely get help from other graduate students and professors. Please have someone proofread your report for you. Even if you're the best proofreader in the whole world, please just swallow your pride and have somebody else look at it because chances are pretty good they will catch things that you don't, and none of us want to have to catch things like that. Um, the next one, so when you work on your talk, of course it should be engaging and inter interesting, but, and this is really important, make sure it is recognizable to your reports, okay? Because like we get your report and we read it, and then we go into your presentation, and if your presentation is totally different, or we don't recognize what's going on in the presentation based on the report, that's like not usually a good thing. And it tells us that you did that presentation like in the last two weeks and like you haven't thought about that at all. So make sure it's somewhat recognizable to your report and it matches. Um, and then please practice your talk in front of a group of people, as Dr. Laskin said. Um, my students always tell me that their friends are harder on them than we, the faculty, are. And they should be. Like, your friends are mean. So you should, like, buy them some pizza and put them in a room and make them listen to you for a couple of hours. And that will be really good practice. Um, and please dress professionally. Like, OP day is not the day for, like, your lucky jammy pants or something. Like, please, like, look somewhat nice. Um, okay, so things that you shouldn't do. Don't forget to reference things. Referencing is really important. In fact, I would err on the side of over-referencing than under-referencing. Um, as Dr. Laskin said, I'm going to say it again, don't fabricate data. We're not supposed to teach you to do that. And if you leave here and do it, we're going to tell you we do not teach you that. Um, 
So make sure, like, you can hypothesize ideas and you can propose ideas, and you want to use those words, hypothesize, propose. You don't want to, um, like, make up a bunch of data or something to show us what it would look like. Um, don't make your report a zillion pages, please, because nobody wants to read all that. So one of the parts of this exercise is making a concise idea. So um, in inorganic, 10 to 15 pages, double-spaced, but go with your home division. Um, don't start your report the week before it's due, obviously. Don't make your talk really long, so 20 to 30 minutes, like Dr. Lashkin said. Um, don't think you have it and don't need to practice it. You don't. <laughs> you don't. So just practice it. It's great to be confident. I applaud that confidence, and you want to bring that with you to the exam, but don't think that you don't have to practice. Um, don't dress like you rolled out of bed. Um, don't think you have to do it by yourself. This is not like a you isolated thing. Like you can ask whoever you want. You can ask your committee, you can ask other faculty members, you can ask other students, you can go to faculty in other departments. I've had students from other departments come and ask me questions on um, their OP topics. So you have a ton of resources out there. Please make sure that you use them. Um, and don't disregard the divisional guidelines. Um, so the other thing I wanted to tell you about is if you go to the Purdue Chemistry website and you go to the individual divisions and you go to the inorganic page, we have like a little tab that says resources. If you click on that, we have um, a proposal guide that was written by Professor Wilker. So this is something that he used to use for his class, but we posted it there because it has lots of good information in it. Um, especially about like developing your ideas and things like that. So I would definitely go out there, go there and check it. Like even if you're not an inorganic, the OP guide or the proposal guide that he has there is kind of just like good general information. So definitely check that out. Um, does anyone have questions? We've got plenty of time. I can start as They all just want to leave. That is true. Um, I guess I'll start us off with one, because um, okay. you did mention about your presentation should look kind of similar to your report, but what if I need to, I need to, I don't need to, um, what if I need to change something if it's, I need to add something or maybe modify something a little bit? It's as, okay to modify things, and you can tell us, oh, I realized I had a problem in my report, so I fixed this, but like, don't come up with a new topic, you know, like, like, small changes are fine, and if you have good reasons for making them, please make them, and then you can tell us. But I have had OPs where I don't recognize the talk versus what I had read before I walked in there. That's generally not a good thing. So, does that mean, like, have we modified the written report? After, no, after you turn it in, you can't. Then it's, like, kind of done. Yeah, okay, so I'll bring up a scenario. So what happens if you hand in your report and then you're working on your presentation and then, oh my God, you find this paper and someone did your idea. And you're like, oh my God, somebody did my idea, what do I do? Are you like totally screwed and gonna fail out of graduate school? Yes. No. <laughs> no, no, okay. So this is what you do. You prepare your presentation you let your committee know in the preparing of this presentation, like after I did what I was supposed to do, I found this paper, like I hadn't found it before. And then you read that paper and there's always gonna be differences between what you propose and the paper proposed. So you can highlight that. I mean, you definitely wanna do like a very thorough literature search to make sure that somebody hasn't done your idea, but you know, as at the last second, you run across the paper and you're like, oh crap, don't worry about it. Just be transparent about it. Let us know about the paper and talk about your work in the context of that paper. Because after all, this exercise is not to come up with an idea that's gonna make us all rich. The purpose of this exercise is for you to come up with a scientific idea and make a well-reasoned argument for why it should be done. And so finding the paper on your topic doesn't take away from that. Would those people's ideas actually work? 
<laughs> oh gosh, I have no idea. I, I mean, the answer is no. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I, the, I sit on like a lot of, of inorganic synthetic ones. Like I'm a synthetic inorganic chemist, right? So I have a pretty good idea if those are going to work. But then I sit in on a lot of organic ones too because I am a synthetic chemist and I have no idea. People come up with these total syntheses that are like 50 steps long, like right? I have no idea. I guess if you're really into your idea, you could convince your advisor to let you try it. Then you would know if it worked. Yeah, you were going to ask a question. Yeah, you uh, said, make sure you actually propose something. Yes. Can you give me, or can you give us an example of what is something that wasn't, like what, can you give us an example of where? Where a student doesn't propose something. Yes. And okay. Where it, and the difference where the student does propose something. Yeah, okay, so I was in this one OP. It was actually for one of my own students. It was a long time ago. Um, and what happened was the student did a very thorough literature review. And they wrote the 10 to 15 pages, and they went through all the literature. And I don't even really know that the student realized they didn't propose something. And it wasn't until the committee said, okay, but we're confused, like, what are you actually going to do here? Could we tell that the student, like, didn't even realize it? So what we did was we gave them, um, we didn't pass them, but we didn't fail them. So we do something called, like, the conditional pass. And so we gave them a month, and we said, okay, you have one month, you got to, now that you know all of this, you got to propose something within the realm of this. And so they proposed, you know, they, they did the rewrite, they made a good proposal, they defended it, they graduated, they had the job, they, you know, turned out to be whole people. So it's okay, but it is important that the proposal aspect of it comes through. Mm -hmm. To what extent our major advisor can be involved? Like, um, the idea so that is division specific, I think. So in inorganic, we are not involved in our students' OPs. Okay. I'm involved in other or inorganic student OPs, but not the ones in my group. I believe it's the same for analytical. I was told, like for me, Scott does not interact with you for the OP. Okay. And for organic as well. Okay. <laughs> he can Adam. Same. Okay. So don't talk to your advisor about it. Go find someone else. It's good networking. And is this similar for every submission that we have to submit our reading document two weeks before the presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, right. Did you have a question? Yes. Can we have a fine? So, first of all, the topic, it's recommended that it's not like obviously, but how far is too much too far and how close is too close? Okay, that is a good question. Because I have had students in my group not wanting to be too close to their research write me a proposal about drug discovery in cells. Mm -hmm. That's too far. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know anything about that. And like I couldn't help them during the exam. Right? So people were firing these questions at them and I'm like, I can't help you. So, you know, I think most PIs, we want to support our students, we want to help our students during the exam. So it's good if it's something that is like in the in the realm, but not exactly. Like so having an are you in organic or you're in analytical. So definitely like what Dr. Laskin was saying, like pick something within the analytical chemistry realm. Like for me instead of mass spec, because I'm in the mass spec group, I just did electrochem in general. Okay. Yeah, that works. Yeah, I mean, in my group, we do a lot of S-element chemistry, so people will propose different um, problems in inorganic chemistry that are energy-related that use, like, transition metals or main group metals or something like that. So something that it's not like, oh, this person is doing the exact same thing, but something that your advisor can still kind of recognize and help you in. Any last-second questions? Really quick ones, short ones. Yeah, one more. Is 
I think I don't know. Um, it's definitely for our division. I know biochem they do go to the NIH format. Is that right? Yeah. So for inorganic, it's 10 to 15 pages. I think divisions that don't have a specific template, that's probably a good rule of thumb. But if you're not sure about it, just ask your advisor. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne. All right, so next we do have biochem again. Every division does have some advice that is nice for other divisions. I do recommend staying the whole time, but if you have to go, totally understand. Um, and so for that, we have Dr. Lyon. I do have a question if you want to use the clicker. Um, oh, which way is which? Yeah, there you go. So the All right. one. All right, so I'm here to tell you about the biochemistry, chemical biology, OP requirements. And sorry, real quick, is it world in biochem? And you're just keeping hand raised. We have updated forms, or updated guidelines, I should say. All right, um, so this is for biochemistry and chemical biology. Um, so we do have a, a format that we want you to follow. We want you to write an NIH style proposal that is like an F31. If you get the handout, there are specific examples and a website that you can go to to see what that proposal would look like. And I'll go through some of those details in, uh, as we go. Um, so first of all, you've got to come up with a topic so it needs to be hypothesis driven. What does that mean? You have a question that you want to answer. That's all it is. Don't get too bogged down and like I need to have like you're in, you know, you're doing a poster session and you've got the hypothesis card on your poster that you've got to fill like back in elementary. Um, so you want to have a hypothesis driven um, project that has something that you are going to test, not just a literature review. Um, you don't want to play it too safe. If you work on a human protein and your proposal is to do the same experiments with a rat protein, no, that is not novel. You need to pick something different. You need to diversify more. Um, significance, you need to make sure that it's a problem that people care about. If you find an idea and you only can find one paper that supports it, don't go there. That's risky. There's a reason that there's only one paper on it. You wanna find something that you can build off of, like a body of literature. So something that people are actually working on and it's not just all one lab. Um, feasibility, could someone, and here we're pretending that money is not an option and you can work 24 seven, um, could you actually get these experiments done in your lifetime? So don't propose that you're gonna cure a disease. You know, sure you can write it, but we all know that's not gonna happen. Something that is tractable, um, that's a smaller step, absolutely fine. And so as you think about what you're trying to write and organize on, um, so you wanna answer why is the work important? You need to convince us why we should care. If you can't convince us why we should care in the first paragraph or two, that's not a good sign. And most of what biochem, chemical biology does, a lot of it is very disease focused. You can make us care pretty easily. What's already been done? So what is the state of knowledge in the field? What is the current technique? What is the current standard of care? And then what are you going to do to advance it? What is your project going to add to the body of knowledge? What are you going to change about the way people think about something? Um, so what are you going to do? And then how are you going to do it? And that's really where the bulk of the proposal is. What are the experiments that you are designing going to do to test your hypothesis? And if your hypothesis is correct, what does the data look like? If your hypothesis is incorrect or is different or needs to change, how would your data reflect that? So all of these things are really gonna work together as you finalize your written document. So this is an NIH style proposal. This means we have rules. We do not want a fancy font. You get to pick Arial or Helvetica. It needs to be black and it can be no smaller than 11 points. Welcome to the rest of your life if you stay in academia. Uh, so we've changed the guidelines. So instead of 10 to 12 single space pages, we want uh, somewhere between five to seven pages. So it's gonna be shorter, which means it's gonna be denser. Uh, you're going to have uh, two documents that we'll talk more about, specific aims and references. References are self-explanatory. These don't count towards the five to seven page limit. Specific aims, whole separate thing. References, you can have as many reference pages as you need. All right, so the specific aims, this is an overview of your entire proposal. 
the whole thing. That means you can't get into too much detail, but we should be able to know what your proposal is about just from your specific aims page. So you're going to have one page or you know, half a page, three quarters of a page, it'll vary a little bit, but you're going to uh, state what the goals of the proposed research are. Why do we care? What are you gonna do about it? What are the expected outcomes? What's going to be learned when you successfully complete all of the experiments you propose? And then how, what is the impact of those results? How is it gonna change the field going forward? So usually this impact of the results is like the very last paragraph or last few sentences in the specific aims. Usually you need at least two specific aims. A lot of people think you need three. I don't know why you don't have two good aims and that's fine. You don't wanna have like a really good aim and then kind of an eh one and then the last one is just like sad trombone. Don't do that. Your first aim should be the strongest aim. So your favorite idea, the experiments that you understand the best, that you are just super jazzed to talk about, that is aim one. Um, and again, your aims page is a standalone document that summarizes the entire proposal. It is not an abstract. You're gonna need more detail than that. It's not an intro. You have to talk about everything you're gonna do, what you're gonna learn from it, and why it matters. So it's good to start with trying to write the specific aims, but you're gonna hate them. And then you're gonna go write your proposal and you're gonna realize that you need to change your aims. This is normal. And again, there's lots of really good examples of specific aims pages online. So you don't have to come up with your own special format for this. So specific aims, first document that, you'll, you'll, that will be in your proposal. The research strategy, this is where most of your data is, most of your writing is going to be. Again, uh, ignore the page limits, they're correct in the handout. Um, so you're gonna have a background of significance. So this is where you get to go into a little bit more detail of why we care or why we should care about your proposed research. What's known? So what has everybody else done? And then what are the big problems left? What are you excited about? And you wanna make it really clear by the end exactly what your proposed research is going to do to answer these questions or to move the field forward or to make people think differently. You're gonna have an innovation section. This is at most a paragraph. People get really, really worked up about the innovation section. You don't have to invent something new. You don't have to come up with a new technique. It can just be bringing two different methods together. Maybe it's a way of thinking about a problem in a very different way that's not standard in the field. So don't beat yourself up because you're not inventing a new device. That's okay. No one expects biochemists to, to design instrumentation most of the time. It's not our specialty. That's why we have analytical people, right? So innovation can be conceptual. Then you're gonna wanna spend the most time on the approach. This is where you lay out what hy your hypotheses are. So you have two aims in most cases. You want your aims to be working towards a central goal. So maybe you wanna figure out how two proteins interact to regulate a process. Aim one can be focused on one protein, aim two could be the other, and then you're gonna work on them independently to answer a question about how they're connected. Something like that. So you wanna have both aims, you can do at the same time. You don't wanna write a proposal where you have to do aim one and it all has to work exactly the way that you propose it will before you can do aim two. That is a kiss of death. Two separate independent ways of approaching something. It can be even two different ways of doing the same type, of getting the same type of information. Maybe you wanna do something with structural biology and then test it using cell-based assays. That's fine. You're getting to the same information, but through very different independent paths. So in this approach, you're gonna spell out what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and we wanna know the details of the experiments, what the data is going to look like, so if you're talking about detecting protein expression, for example, that is so much easier to just find an example of what that would look like, whether it's an SDS page gel or a Western blot. Don't try to explain that something is gonna get darker versus lighter. Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words, take advantage of it. You're also going to wanna to talk about potential problems, alternative strategies, things like that. What happens if your data looks weird? What happens if your proteins don't behave the way you think they will? How are you gonna troubleshoot it? What are other things you can do? What if your whole aim blows up in your face? What are you gonna learn from it? 
One of my favorite questions to ask at OPs is what happens if none of this works? Which is a very real concern in any sort of experiment, right? You wanna have something to show for it and not like the journal of negative results, but you wanna set up something where you're still going to be able to contribute to the field, even if your favorite hypothesis is wrong, right? You can still learn a lot from it. Um, another big thing that I wanna uh, hit you over the head with are controls. How are you going to know your experiment is working? How are you going to detect things? If you're making mutants, how are you gonna make sure that you didn't break the protein by making that mutation? Maybe you did want to break it, in which case, how are you going to confirm that the mutation broke the protein in the way that you predicted it would? So you kind of want to let yourself go down that rabbit hole a little bit and make sure that you can plug up the holes as you think about what the data could look like and how you could interpret that data. And again, this is a, a great resource, your committee, your friends, the classes you're taking, all of that is fair game to use to come up with experiments or learn more about a technique that could help you uh, plan out your experiments and your proposal. Okay, so far? You can do this. You really can. Okay, general tips. This should not be an incremental step forward. You don't want to you don't want to play it too safe so that we can't actually tell what you proposed or what you are testing or what you're going to contribute to the field. Don't cure a disease. Like, I know it's really tempting, but just don't go there. Uh, there's nothing magical about having three specific aims. Two are fine. That's two good ideas are better than one great one and then two sad ones. You want to make sure you have control experiments. You want to think about potential problems, alternative approaches. You know, if you're trying to measure something one way, what are two other ways that you could do it um, in case the first one doesn't work? Ask your peers for examples of their OPs. And if you are going to ask them for their OPs and their advice, you need to listen to it when they give it to you, even if you don't like it and your feelings get hurt. Uh, and that sounds really harsh, but that's how we write grants too. You give it to the person that you know is always knows enough that they're dangerous and you don't really want them to ever come to your seminars because they always have a question. That is who you wanna practice with. That is the OP you wanna see. You want someone who holds your feet to the fire. Um, and they are gonna be the best help in making sure that you have an airtight OP. You wanna proofread, you wanna have practice talks. We can tell if you haven't actually thought about it. Um, you know, Don't propose the same experiment in both aims and then copy paste the methods. We do catch on to that. That's still plagiarism even if you copied yourself. Um, everything in your proposal and in your presentation is fair game for questions. So if you're working on a pathway for example, where you know, like you have all the different colored shapes and symbols, and you're only going to talk about two of those shapes, hide everything else. Otherwise, we're going to get distracted and we're going to ask about the others. You can control the narrative to some extent, right? You want to focus on one thing, hide everything else. And it's okay if you, uh, if your presentation has evolved by the time you present. If your presentation differs slightly from what your written document says, this happens all the time. You know, you have this idea, you've hammered it out, you got it out to your committee, and now you, you're starting to practice it. And you realize that some of these experiments might, might, might not work the same way. Totally fine to adjust it. We're not gonna make you defend something that you've realized is not the best way of doing something. Just tell us that, hey, I initially proposed this, but, as you know, over the last few weeks, as I've learned more about it, I think a better way of doing it is why. Absolutely fine. And this is also true, um, as Dr. Bark touched on, if someone publishes a paper that overlaps with what you're doing. Uh, all right, so you want to be clear and concise. You're going to have probably a 20 to 30 minute presentation. That's about 20 to 30 slides. You can have all the backup slides you want, um, but keep in mind you are definitely going to get interrupted. And really, we're just asking questions because we're either curious, because sometimes you are all very creative and you come up with topics that we have absolutely no idea about or how you got to it. Uh, and so we will ask you, like, how did you come up with this? Uh, and then we're also going to ask you about methods. You know, what are your controls? How will you know if this works the way that you think it did? What will you learn? What if everything fails? All of that sort of thing. It's not meant to be mean. Like, it's good. this is going to be challenging, but we're not trying to, like, break you psychologically. The point of the questions is to see what you know 
how you think on your feet, because at some point you're, you know, you're all TAs, you've all had to answer a question when your mind just goes totally blank. So this is, can you think on your feet scientifically? And then what we usually, what usually ends up happening is we're gonna get to a point where you don't know the answer. That's fine. We don't expect you to know the answer to everything. We just wanna know if we get you to that point, can you come up with a new hypothesis? Or can we tell you other facts that you can integrate into a hypothesis? It's not, oh, well, you don't know anything about this, so now we're just gonna keep asking questions about this one topic. No, that's not fun, that's awful. We want you to succeed, and so we're gonna try and feed you the information that we think you need to come up with that next step. But again, ideally it's a conversation. It's not gonna feel that way, but it's not a criticism of you or your ideas. And then again, you can have as many backup slides as you want. Ask your friends and neighbors for help. The only person who really can't help you is your advisor. Um, but if you wanna propose a method that someone in MCMP is an expert in, go talk to that faculty member. We do this all the time. It's not a big deal. We're happy to help. You're not an island. Uh, you're gonna be fine when, it's, when all is said and done. Uh, so, Questions, the guidelines are, the written guidelines are updated, um, but overall it's the same information. We just want the proposals a little shorter. Yeah. Hi, yeah, um, I just have a few questions. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. So it should basically be a foreign concept to going on this event. That's the first time I ever heard of what you're doing. So, so I usually, my students will usually tell me or give me a very broad idea of what it is like so so we work on effector enzymes and so they'll tell me my project is on receptors it's like okay i, I know something about that um but i don't know anything else um, so but you know if, if if everyone in your lab is working on say deubiquitinases that doesn't mean you're not allowed to work on a ubiquitin dependent process I would just not pick a D ubiquitinase. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Of course. Um, and kind of with that, uh, in the actual room when you do the presentation, it sounds like kind of a fine that your PI also would come by. Yes. Yes. Your PI is there. Uh, usually your PI is the quietest person in the room because we want you to, to shine on your own. And it's really stressful for us too. Like, no, no lie, it's awful for your PI. Um, because we know you can do it and we want you to do well. And we've heard you talk about science. Uh, so they, we were usually the most quiet and it's your other committee members that will ask the bulk of the questions. And usually when I speak up, it's to feed a piece of information that I know you know, it's just not coming out right now. And to smile and nod encouragingly. So it's supposed to be <laughs> Yes, it should not be antagonistic. No. Yeah, yes, like, yeah, yeah. Your PI is there to be your friend and to look pained the whole time because we can't help it. We are, we are running slightly behind, so I will we'll have to cut it off there. If you have questions, yeah. you can email me. Right, exactly. So thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Super appreciate it. But yeah, uh, next we have Keegan. Again, all the divisions have information that overlaps very well. It's really nice to hear. So we have uh, uh, Dr. Watson next. I do have a clicker if you want to use it. Um, it should be the bottom arrow so it goes forward. Okay, yes, so I'm afraid I'll be repeating a lot of what you, you heard already. Uh, especially, uh, I was here for the presentation of Suzanne Bart. Uh, there will be a lot of overlap with that one. In fact, if you, if you have the list of do's and don'ts from her, uh, but do you have it uh, with you? Uh, thank you. This is the list of do's and don'ts that uh, Suzanne Bart. Uh, and we are out of copies, so you uh, will get an email. Uh, okay. Anyway, I just wanted to say that they are exactly the same ones uh, in PKM, except for one. And I was curious to know if you should guess that one if you have it. But uh, I guess not, not all of you have it, right? So, um, choose a topic that interests, and I won't go through all of them. The last one in, in organic is. Dress professionally for your presentation. 
as when I get the side, side thing that the heat thing is just like inorganic except you don't have to blow stuff it. It's nice if you do, but it's not a requirement. Um, okay, so I only have two slides, so this will be pretty quick. The first slide about what is expected uh, for the peak and divisions, OP, and the second slide on some preparation tips. Hopefully, will be helpful. This first slide is about what is expected, with two caveats here. Note one: specific expectations vary among faculty, and that's just part of the exercise, right? Everyone, everyone in your committee will have maybe somewhat different expectations, and that's part of the game. Um, the challenge is to convince everyone in the committee that what you're doing is interesting, uh, even though everyone is different. And by the way, it's the same thing with actual proposals. You will give your proposal to the NSF or NIH, evaluated by a committee. Everyone has a different expectation there, but your proposal has to be full proof and convince everyone that it's a worthwhile idea. But the general expectations are all the same for all. The OP should be original, interesting, and generally correct. From the written document and the oral presentation, it should be clear that you have studied well an area not directly linked to your PhD project. And here there's room for discussion of what exactly do you mean by directly linked. But it should not be your research project for your PhD, something else. And you can clearly identify and state one concrete problem that you are proposing to solve. I know in the previous presentation, uh, Professor Lyon mentioned two aims, or possibly three aims, preferably two aims. In PICM, one, one is good enough. And uh, it should be clear from the written document and the oral presentations that you have studied and understood the fundamental PICM principles that provide appropriate background or context to your proposal. So you choose a problem and there's some background related to that problem. You need to be pretty strong on that background. And you have given some serious thought to how you would attempt to solve or approach the problem and what the main challenges are. So I think these are the three points. I wanted to make uh, on, on the general expectations. And then the next slide has just a list of preparation tips that are, again, very overlapping with those of Suzanne Barr's uh, list that will be sent along by email. Uh, but here are mine, a uh, few preparation tips. So first, make it interesting. And for that, you need to be actually interested. Um, and then try to convey your excitement to the committee. It's very difficult otherwise, right? Uh, uh, hard to imagine that you find it pretty boring, but the committee will find it fascinating. It's not very likely. The opposite may happen, isn't it, right? You find it fascinating, but the committee uh, well, And here for that, uh, try, uh, this is my personal uh, ad advice, is try to Maybe you have a gut feeling that this is interesting, but you don't really know why. But there's probably a good reason why you, you think it's interesting. So you try to pin down why you find the topic interesting. You're talking to yourself about this. And then explain this as best as you can to the committee. Be ready to explain the meaning of every word, plot, comment from your written document and slides. If something is not necessary to make your point, then maybe better than to include it. Um, because um, it just confuses things and it also increases the chances that the committee will ask you about something that's not so central to your idea and will lead you to places you don't want to go. Uh, this was also emphasized a lot before. Uh, it also, I agree it's a very good idea and when practicing, put yourself in the shoes of someone 
who is listening to your presentation for the first time. You pretend you're one of your committee members and what is it that they're going to, to ask you. And they will want to know whether the speaker, that's you, has a clear proposal in mind. Ask yourself whether you know the meaning of everything you're showing on your slides. So you look at your own plots and you ask about the units and if you don't know the units, you need to include them. And you ask yourself all the questions as if you were one of your committee members. A strive for clarity. Now, the committee will be impatient to know what your main point is right from the beginning um, and why it is interesting and important. And so for that, I think, and I, I, I think others also in the PICAM division agree with this, it's always a good idea to have one slide that clearly states the problem you are proposing to solve and why. It's not necessary, but this is something I like, and I know others do too, and it's very hard to do. This matches with the summary page that Angeline Lyon was indicating for the NIH proposal. We don't have a specific f format like they do in biochemistry, um, but, uh, but the ideas are there, the same idea. You may have chosen a topic that no one in the room knows much about, and that's fine, but it raises some special challenges. The questions will go to the core and to probing the overall logic. Also, like uh, Angeline said, it's not, not a problem to make a few mistakes or to say a few things that are incorrect. Uh, the problem is sometimes to not recognize this and then try to mask uh, some of the misunderstandings uh, and confuse the committee, and that sometimes doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, I think that's all I brought. Yes, it's very short. Questions? Especially, they've seen so many of these. They know if you're trying to hide something. <laughs> <laughs> back on time, right? Back yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I put extra minutes, just in case anyone's coming in a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, how would you balance, specifically for PTM, because it's more theoretical, how would you balance? Like trying to go for something more fundamental versus trying to do something that you could actually have a chance of understanding. Like, um, well, uh, the, the OK could be in theory or it could be experimental, right? Mm -hmm. um, in both cases, well, the word the word fundamental is open to debate, right? What is fundamental? Um, need to identify a problem. It could be a theoretical problem or an experimental problem. And that problem should be clearly stated. And the background related to that problem should be well explained. Um, and it's up to you how... Well, so I think that defining the, the problem clearly enough is is equally difficult no matter who, what type of... What do you mean by fundamental? I, I guess it seems from my perspective that it would be easier to go a little further off what people have done in an experimental sense as opposed to a theoretical sense. But maybe that's not true. No, I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, there are some fields that have uh, of research that have, uh, I don't know, 16 years of development, and if you don't know anything about that field, it's maybe not the best choice because you have to get up to speed with too much to be able to propose something truly original. Um, so, um, but there's so much uh, low-hanging fruit everywhere. Uh, in, in, uh, yeah. And that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Do you have any like um, kind of good examples of identifying the like, like maybe a theory problem and the importance of it? Like, like strong ones that kind of target fundamental theory. Um, I have to 
look back in the old piece that I have attended to. Um, sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, yes, so, so I, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, a student of mine uh, did that very well on his, in his OP, decided to take the, now machine learning is this uh, boom, right? So take the field of machine learning. How can you improve approximations that people use in electronic structure using machine learning? And then there's just so much to I and mean, then he took one specific aspect of this problem and developed it. I think it's actually working on it now. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. And next we have organic. So thank you very much for jumping in this year. Um, yeah, so it's the bottom arrow that I see. Bottom goes forward. forward. Yeah. It, it's, I, I love these because they're confusing. So Yeah, they work really well, but they are very confusing. The first couple times, so. If you guys didn't get a handout because there were handouts going around, I am out of handouts. Um, you will get them in an email, though, so don't worry. And if you lose the piece of paper, also don't worry. You'll get it in an email. So, um, yeah, right. that's Awesome. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, awesome. So I am here to tell you there are a couple different parts of the OP. I would say the hardest part is your topic selection. And so this has already been covered a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it just in case some of y'all just came in. Make sure you pick something that is interesting to you. If you don't find it interesting, no one else will. I personally think reviews are a great place to start oftentimes, because oftentimes they'll identify certain areas in the field that still are in need of further research. So for organic students, there are kind of four main types of OPs that we see. And depending on which type, now you don't have to go with these four. I'm not saying this is the only possibility. I'm just saying this is usually what we see. And based on this, there you are likely to get different types of questions. And so if you decide to go for a multi-step synthesis, oftentimes a natural product type synthesis, you should be able to answer why you want to make this molecule. Um, just because it's fun doesn't really, that's not a good answer. Because it has a really complicated structure that's hard to access, that's a good answer. But you need to be able to say why. Um, you also need to have kind of references that show that the steps that you're proposing are possible. Don't just go off into space and say, yes, this reaction will work with no evidence for that. Um, you also, need to be able to have alternative approaches. And so you think this reaction will work great, but oh wait, you forgot about this other functional group over here that's not compatible with this reaction. What else could you do? As far as synthetic methodology goes, you should, and this is true of multi-step synthesis as well, but especially for synthetic methodology, know your mechanism. So if you're thinking about developing a new methodology, you need to know how other people do it, how those mechanisms work, and the likely mechanism through which your process would work. You can definitely do computational modeling, but as I think other people have already brought up, don't make stuff up. So if you think that, oh, I think this would go through this sort of pathway, if you want to do some DFT calculations and put it in your proposal, that's great. But don't say that it will go through this without any sort of either computational backup or you can propose it might go through this and this is how you would test it. For chemical biology um, or medicinal chemistry type approaches, one of the things I want to bring up is you are not going to make a new drug. You're just not. I'm sorry, you're not. Um, I'm probably never going to make a new drug in my, however long my career is, you're not in two to three years. So think about what questions your molecules are going to answer. Are they going to help get at mechanism? You want to design molecules. You don't want to say, I'm going to just randomly make all these derivatives and see what works. That's not a good proposal. And functional materials, I think we're actually going to have a materials thing next, so I'm not going to touch on that. Dr. May will talk about that. Your project needs to be hypothesis driven. Now, this looks a little different from biochemistry. Your hypothesis might be that I can, that, for example, this methodology will work for these reasons. You might just prove your hypothesis. 
you need to still learn something from it, even if your hypothesis isn't true. And we've already heard this a couple times, but please make sure you talk to other people. Older graduate students, postdocs, other professors, you are not allowed to talk to your PI about your project other than I would say, you can say basically, is this far enough for my research? Because organic, we do expect it to be distinct from the research you're currently doing. That doesn't mean you can't, if you're making, if you're doing synthetic methodology, you can still do synthetic methodology, but maybe if you're working on copper chemistry, maybe don't propose copper chemistry. Um, the other thing I do want to point out is you can talk to people outside of your lab. So I'm saying older graduate students, you don't have to stay in your lab because I know sometimes they don't have the expertise of whatever your OP is. So find who does have the expertise to talk to. As far as writing your proposal goes, we do not have a certain format for organic. I do think that doing either an NIH style or an NSF style grant is a good idea, but it is not required. There are some really nice examples of the NIH style format. I also have this book outside of my office, so feel free to come by, read it, take photocopies of it. It walks you through how to write an NIH proposal. I've recently gotten the NSF version as well, and that should be outside of my office soon. Um, these are my suggestions. They are not rules. But based on what I have done before, in general, six to eight pages, single space, including figures and charts, but not references, is a good thing to go for. I think this has already been said, but figures are great. I always aim for one figure or scheme per page. We're lazy. We have a lot to read. If you have a figure describing each main point of your proposal, it's a lot easier for us to understand. I personally like kind of this aerial black font, size 11 or larger. Again, not complete requirement, but you want to make a path. Make it easy to read. Have sections, like have a bold section. If you're, you're going to have your intro section, then you're going to have the Let's say you're doing a total synthesis of natural product X. Here's how I'm going to get the core. Here's how it's been previously done and how mine differs. You want to tell us why yours is better, why you think yours is going to be better than what's already been done. I like a specific aims page. I think it's nice. I think it helps your reader to follow through what you're doing. Then you don't have to, but I think it's nice to have that short intro and then the two to three aims that you are proposing to do. Now, you don't have to necessarily include it as certain sections, but you need to make sure you tell us the background of your project. Why is it important? What have other people already done? And remember to reference, that's really important. You need to tell us what your innovation is. What? Why is what you're doing better than what's been done before? What problem are you solving? And how is your solution unique? And then finally, your approach and its methods. What are you actually going to do? What are you actually proposing? If controls are necessary, what are they? Now, certain synthesis might not have those certain controls, but if you're doing more chemical biology, you likely are going to need certain controls. And this is where you can talk to older students or fa other faculty members. What controls do you need? And alternative approaches. I've already said that, but I'm going to say it again. Start early. Y'all are already doing a great job being here, learning about this process. If you put this off, you will not be able to do it. I don't say that to scare you. I just say that as fact. Start early. Um, ideally, give people at least a week to read your proposal and give feedback. It doesn't have to be perfect before you give it to someone for feedback. In fact, I think that's too late. You should give it to them when it's still a little rough so that they can actually help you. Because if you give them it two days before, they're not going to be able to tell you, oh, well, I really think you need to reformat. 
they're going to just give you typos. If you give it to them a couple of weeks ahead of time, they'll be able to say, well, I like this idea, but this other idea don't feel like it really fits and you might want to change it. And that's the advice you want. You probably don't can't really read this, but I like this by this comic and it's like he's saying how he has he used to hate writing assignments, but now he enjoys them. That he realized that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. Uh, obviously that's not what you want to do. Um, be clear. Be clear in your writing. Um, it's hard to be clear in your writing. It's really easy to be confusing. So you want to take the time to make it. You want to make your reader happy. If your professors come into this having read your proposal and like, could read it easily, that's going to be a lot better for you than if we're sitting here being like, what are they saying? I'm confused. And you're a lot less likely to do that if you've already had other people read it. As far as your presentation goes, again, a lot of people have already said this, but aim for about 30 minutes. It will be longer, around 30 slides. We will interrupt you. For organic, be prepared to go up to the board and potentially have to write out a mechanism. That is normal. We do it all the time. We are not doing it to be mean. We are doing it because we want to see what your knowledge is. We are not trying to torture you. We are trying to help you go through a process. I've been told, and I think this is true, every OP, we professors are going to push until you don't know something. It's okay to say, I don't know. To say, I don't know, but here is my here are my thoughts. And here's how I might test that. Um, minimize background slides. One, we want to really actually hear about your proposal. Two, if you have a ton of background slides, we're going to get bogged down in the background slides and ask you questions you don't want to be asked. Minimize the slide content to what you need to tell your story. Um, you also want to minimize text on slides. Um, this is a terrible slide. Y'all are already bored just looking at it. I know you are, because I am, and I wrote it. You want pictures are nice, structures are great, minimal text. It's fine to have the notes, like when you have notes on presenter mode, that's great, but you don't want a page of text. Have backup slides. If you know that you have certain mechanisms that are important, go ahead and have a backup slide. You might have one or two professors that say, no, 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 I don't want you to go to that. I want you to go to the board. So be prepared to also write it out. But if it's a complicated mechanism, definitely have a backup slide. We've already talked about this, but include controls if necessary. Be able to talk through how you know whether a reaction was a certain experiment was successful or not. And practice in front of other people. Usually, this is, I think, already been said, oftentimes your friends and colleagues are meaner than we are. Tell them to focus on content and tell them to, tell them who is on your committee because that also helps them think about what types of questions to ask. I think that's pretty much it. Yep. So that is it. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah. I was going to say, or ask, um, when you mentioned like the uses of your portfolio approaches, yeah. how unique is it have to be? So, like, for example, let's say you want to do a multi part synthesis, uh -huh. and one of your steps is like a set communication. Right. And it's like, can you just reference another picture yeah. and say, oh, I'm going to do something similar to this guy? Yes. This is why. So, this is a great question. So, for those like multi step total synthesis type projects, you're definitely going to have some protecting group slides and things that are not going to be totally unique. You need to have at least one step in that synthesis that is the cool step and the reason why it is interesting. So you're, you're, if you do a total synthesis, yeah, every step is not going to be, oh my god, this is so novel and interesting. But you need to be able to point out at least one step where yours is better than everything else and unique in some way. Does that help? 
think that we have one more question for the other one. Yeah. So yeah. you are trying to pick, let's say, like you said, let's pick a cell that is different from that. <laughs> Must it be better or just different? So, in general, I would say you need some. Why am I funding it to do this? Remember, this is a proposal for money. If it's not better, why would I be the one to do it? Now, better can mean a lot of things. Is it greener? Are you able to do it in water, less toxic chemicals, things like that? So better doesn't necessarily have to mean it's super more higher yielding or something like that. It can just, you need some sort of catch that you can argue that it will be better and convince others that there's a reason to do it differently. And I use green air as an example. There are lots of other things. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah, well, thank you again so much for jumping in. Yeah, of course. Speaking of jumping in, uh, now we have Dr. May. Thank you so much for jumping in <laughs> right at the last minute. We um, didn't have materials last year because there weren't any materials OPs yet. So this will be our first year with this. Um, <laughs> No, I threw in a, an extra one, but all of your slides are there. And I do have a clicker. Right. If you want the clicker, uh, it's the bottom, but I'm just probably just pushing this. So, Matthias OP will not be too yeah. different from the rest of the RGs. Um, no, it is an exam, right? So, what you need to do, and um, I use this sentence here choose a topic that excites you. You think either you're going to get money from uh, NSF, DOE, DOD, or eventually in 30 years, we will win your Nobel Prize. All right. So this topic could be material synthesis, material characterization, processing, application. Whatever you feel that you know, this is the topic. You could be excited once actually you get the money to carry out. All right. So please skip forward. Now for the format, actually I copied this uh, from some uh, other yeah, you can even remember. So the font size, 11 points and larger. Don't use it actually squeezing everything into tiny, like 10 points of uh, times and longs. Uh, it's very difficult to read. Um, 10 to 12 pages maximum, and uh, not the more the merrier. And uh, including actually uh, biggest charts, tables, and schemes, everything that included. Now, this would help. But it's not actually uh, the specific aims. Actually, this is a uh, um, NIH standard, but not necessary for DOE and the NSF. And but in actually, it will help actually your committee to understand you propose much easier if you actually provide uh, specific aims, right? And what exactly you intend to do. You're using actually one page of executive summary in front of actually your proposal. All right. So for this part, for this question, uh, for this. Is any confusion on this? That's the key part. Any topic related to materials chemistry, okay? Synthesis, characterization, processing, and uh, uh, applications. Either way, you find something that excites you. All right. Now, in the proposal abstract, the truth is that you know, probably that you committee member. I'm not going to read every single word you write there, but they must, you know, they probably will do and have to do actually read your abstract. In other words, writing a good abstract is very important. Uh, similarly, that's true actually when you write a real grant proposal. This is the part people will actually get the idea. You know, most of the people probably even can make actually make up their mind through the abstract writing. Okay, they understand whether they understand this actually is something interesting or not. So in the abstract, okay, you need to provide the background. What do you intend to do? And what actually is the problem you're trying to address? And do you actually have something already there, the preliminary data to you know to give you people confidence that actually is doable? And how actually you're gonna do that exactly? So that actually would be in the abstract. So here, actually, um, I gave you an example. That's pretty clear abstract. All right. The background, global warming, is you know pressing concerns. That's a very important problem. Uh, but we lack effectivity model to predict precisely 
that's the problem, right, with lack of something. And then the objective is also pretty clear. We propose to do what? All right. And how exactly we're going to do? We will access this data to blah, 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 blah. Then eventually, actually, that the significance will dramatically advance our understanding of solar activity of this climate effect. So pretty much that, you know, this would tell you reviewers or the, your committee what actually the entire proposal is about and when actually, you know, I should spend time to continue reading or not. Right. If you cannot actually even put up actually a logic, you know, convincing abstract, it's very difficult to convince your review panel that you know the proposal is well written. Okay. So spend time to understand what you are doing, trying to actually write a good abstract. It's very critical. Okay. Now you know written proposal. Let's just make it more specific. So I'm not going to read all these kind of things. But you know, you propose you need to have background hypothesis, you approach, then actually what you're going to deliver. All right, so you can go to read, you know, the guidelines there. I also actually put up these things here, you know, trying to uh, help you write that exactly, you know, to avoid the redundancy. You know, sometimes we have the inclination to write very long sentence. The matter of fact is that it's very difficult to read. And also, actually, we use using very, uh, you know, long, beautiful words to describe the things. You know, amazingly surprising. You know, so many different activity words to describe it. Just make it plain, okay? People can judge for themselves. Uh, you don't need to say this is a fantastic study, okay? People can understand whether this is a fantastic study or not. You just need to provide, you know, the fact people can judge themselves. All right. <coughs> And uh, yeah, so you know, these are the things that you're trying to uh, trying to avoid. Okay, that will help actually the people to understand your proposal better. And uh, the final part is the presentation, right? You write actually the proposal, ten to twelve page, and then you're going to go to defend your proposal. So to make things easier, usually most of people will actually do your presentation to make slides. All right. Now, in real time, actually, people can use Chuck Talk to do the proposal. That's not very uh, often, not very popular now. So people instead actually using presentation. So you certainly you can have title page. What actually is your proposal about? Then you need to define clearly actually what are your research problems, what actually you are trying to address. Then you need to discuss very clearly so that people understand, you understand the problem. That actually is to present clearly what is the gaps in the literature. The things that you intend to address have not been addressed already in literature. So you need to present what have been done. Then it's actually your research, research aim objectives. Okay, so what you exactly intend to accomplish. Then how are you going to do it? Explain how exactly you're going to do it. Then you have one slide to summarize everything, you know, to tell your committee what are you going to accomplish if you are awarded to, to perform this project? Now, this actually is the, the highlight, okay? OP is an exam. Means that uh, you will be asked to defend whatever in your slide and beyond your slide. What that means is, for instance, that just give you a very simple example. You're talking about the chemical reactions. Um, people are going to ask you what is the definition of entropy? What is the definition of entropy? What the WG means? This is very basic thing. Okay, that's actually you would expect that, and that actually probably is the most difficult part of OOP. It's not actually to defend your proposal because you spend so much time on preparing, writing, and uh, putting everything together. You know what you are talking about. This part. The basic concept in your proposal is often a part people get scratched their head, can you know, articulate very clearly. So with that being said, you know, my recommendation for preparing your presentation is that at least you need to make sure, you know, the concept in your proposal, the base you know, the basic stuff in your proposal, you need to understand what that means. Okay. Uh, for instance, 
if you are working in my case, if you are working on on a polymer, at least you need to know, you know, how usually people will characterize a polymer. Even though that's not part of probably that that you are proposing, but you need to know that because you propose it about a polymer. That's actually the basic information. You need to, you know, what will be the common ways to characterize the molecular ways, how you can get the actual phase transition information and all related concepts. All right. So as I said that. Materials chemistry is not so much different from the rest DRGs. You need to write a proposal. You need to write a proposal. You need to defend your proposal, and here actually give you some guidelines so that actually you can go ahead to prepare for it. And actually, as a matter of fact, actually one of my own students actually just passed actually last week, so even before knowing all this, it's not very difficult. All right, questions. So this piece of proposal theoretically to like a department somewhere. Do we ask for money and does the money that we ask for include like building up our own lab or like can we assume that we'll have like the materials we need on hand? So um as I noted here, whole key is exam. You pretend you are writing a proposal to get financial support to care of the project. And so you do with assume you already have the inside infrastructure and the facility to perform your, your research. So in reality, when we use on the PI to write a proposal, it's actually that question will be answered is that do you have the facility to perform your research on that? So the answer is short, that if you don't, then you write you need to propose it right now. I can say that a little bit, there's no way specific, like, oh, I would like $50,000, but it's like, you know, we don't. <laughs> so, no more on, on this point, uh, a lot of the proposals generally have, like, new requirements that show, like, a timeline, uh, and maybe even, like, what are the funds dedicated to it? Yeah. Uh, in OT that you know you're going to do that, in real proposal depends on who, which agency you are writing for. And um, some of them require such a milestone, livable, very clear, and a timeline. Different in the exam, you know. uh, Yeah, that's more about that you uh, project management. When coming up with a written proposal, um, it seems like it's very much background research focus as well as writing your own proposal. Um, how importantly would you weigh the two, and would you do your background research while you're proposing or compartmentalize them? What's your advice on approaching these two experiences? Uh, well, typically, when you write up a funny it is really on something that is very critical. And that is that all you have a very important problem to, to address. So the literature, the literature search helps you clarify whether the assumption is correct or not. And also to what degree this has been addressed so that you don't need random history. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again for right. last minute edition. Super appreciate it. Sure. Cool. So yeah, we're gonna get started with our graduate student panel now. Just to let you guys know, this is entirely question based. I do have some I can start asking if no one raises their hand, but. This is the part where you guys just need to go, what did you do? How did it happen? What Did you finish your OP? I didn't personally, but I still passed. So um, yeah, if our graduate students want to start heading up, trying to get you guys chairs. Wait, how not finish your OP? No, I had to skip about two thirds of my OP uh, presentation. Oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they kept asking me questions, so. Okay, cool. And then, I guess, one of the
It's going back. It's growing back. Almost there. Um, so for inorganic people, sorry, no one volunteered from inorganic, so blame your older students. But here's everybody's uh, names and their departments. So we do have two analytical representatives. We were going to have two organic. One of them got COVID. Um, so she's not here. But yeah, so we have uh, Nick and Emily. They're both um, in the analytical department. We have Kai. She is in biochemistry. We have Zach, uh, who is now alone today for organic. And then we have Jack. Um, and they are all freshly done their OP. Like we were all in the past year done our OP. I believe I'm not... I'm like, you're all my year, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So um, it should be pretty fresh in our heads. Um, does anyone have any questions right off the bat? I can start doing my random ones that I have. Um, pretty standard ones, but yeah. How did you uh, end up scheduling? I sent out a doodle poll to three of my committee members, just said, well, in one hour blocks, what times work for you? Okay. So um, did you like pick a week? Well, yeah, because they'll. I think I actually picked a couple weeks. And you have to do it way in advance, too, because all the professors are super busy. So I just, like, started the semester. I knew I want to do my OP this semester. I didn't even have it finished yet, but I just sent out a poll. When is it going to work? And then found an hour that they could do that I wanted to do. I wanted to do it as early in the day as I could, which meant I had to do it at 5 p.m. <laughs> uh, because they couldn't do any earlier than that. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, that's how I did it. I think same for me, I sent out one to me link and I just go and fill out all the dates. I think I gave them uh, three weeks options and believe it or not, only one day it actually worked all three of them. So yeah, I recommend to send it out early. Um, it's like three steps. Is it like a week in advance, a month in advance? No, no. Six months in advance, like a year in advance. At least a month. If you feel like doing it now, feel free to do it now. Yeah, <laughs> if you're doing it this semester, you want to send that to a plow like as soon as you can, I think. And I'd, I'd also say the earlier you schedule it, the earlier you start like having that panic to actually work uh, on it. <laughs> I had some friends that like kind of waited until like they had like a good idea to schedule it, and they kind of started really late. So I'd say like even if you have no idea whatsoever, schedule it. Schedule it. Okay. Yeah. Because you're going to do it anyway, so you might as well have a date for it. <laughs> like, I, I guess I emailed out about now, last year, and I ended up doing it, like, early November, I think. Yeah. So that's how early I to schedule it. Away. I had to harass one of my professors uh, on the committee, like, over and over for them to get, like, uh, scheduled and stuff, because they just never filled out anything back to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so some professors are really good about scheduling the OP and stuff, some are very not. So you kind of have to meet their needs. It's probably the hardest part of the OP is getting all three people to be in the same room at the yeah. same time. It'll be kind of frustrating. Just keep on them eventually or find a day. And once you have a time and date, send reminder emails. Like uh, a week before, three days before, before. day before, the day of the play. They will forget. He'll fill his like 10 minutes of the mind. So. <laughs> We're allowed to use it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I guess this is kind of like a general question for everybody. So the length of your oral exam, I didn't finish the oral exam basically in summary, will greatly vary. Some people finish in like 40 minutes, some people finish in two hours, or if you recall that finishing. Um, but, yeah, no, so uh, mine was a forensics-based OP, I'm also analytical, and um, mine had a lot of background I had to go through, so I was questioned a lot on my background, so I didn't even actually get to show them the part of my OP where it's like, here's how I'm making my device, because a lot of analytical students make a device. Um, but yeah, so we basically skipped the entire center section of my OP, which was like two-thirds of it, and they had me jump to the very end, because they were like, we have to go at 5.30, and it's so getting there. <laughs> it wasn't even a lot of background, it was just that they kept asking, and that's actually where some of my backup slides came in handy, actually I got to use some of them, so it's kind of fun when you do get to use those. Um, but yeah, how long is everybody's OP, actually, like the oral exam, if I, you remember? I think I went the full two hours, and then also had to wrap up fast, because they were like, hey, we gotta go, you gotta step out so we can talk about it, so I think the last slide or two. It makes you think you're gonna fail, too, if you're like, you take the full two hours, you're like, 
oh no, I didn't even get to say everything. But it's you really can't follow like you make the PowerPoint and you think you have a flow of what you're going to talk about that will. I don't think that'll ever survive the OP because they'll <laughs> ask so many questions and some of them hopefully you're ready for. Probably not all of them, but. This 45 minutes for me uh, is mainly because my topic was very limited. It's mainly uh, metalloid enzymes. So I basically put a cofactor that everybody already know, and then an enzyme put it together and have a new catalysis. So it's fairly straightforward, I think. So there's not a lot of background, and I was able to get through everything within 45 minutes. Vinyl is about an hour. And about like the last 10 minutes of that was actually talking about research and stuff. It was like an hour and a half. I got through my whole presentation and then uh, also talked about research. So it's pretty standard. Mine was like, no. This was very wild, man, too. I think it kind of depends on who you have on your committee as well. Some people have asked a lot more questions than others. But like the professor said, at least, I mean, if anyone has a different opinion, I'd love to hear it. Um, they're not trying to be mean, but they will ask you questions until you don't know the answer. They really will. Um, it's always good if you can even have a guess at something, though, even if it's entirely wrong. It just shows that you're thinking. So I'm sending out uh, polls to my committee and getting a day figured out, and um, was aiming for the first week of October initially, and I still think I am, but I'm getting a little bit cold feet. I'm getting <laughs> nervous about that time frame. Um, I included some days a few weeks after, but I'm curious like how much time each of you guys gave to your process and what sort of time frame you think is realistic um, from the ambitious to painfully long end of time for I scheduled mine first week of October, and I didn't send mine out until the start of the semester because June told me, she's like, don't need to be working until the start of the semester. Yeah. So then I just... Start yeah, some of them might be away at the moment too, so if they don't respond, yeah. just re email them. Just stay, she goes, I think they're gone. And they did. So, I think they're fine. Just to send it down. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'll give like, like two, I give like two week blocks. Like, huh? first week, second week of October. Basically, like two, two hour blocks. And then that kind of but yeah, I think, I think he's more wondering about time frame of getting the Oh, getting an idea? I didn't have an idea. Yeah. Um, I didn't have an idea until. Till September? Yeah, I didn't have an idea until September. I guess I, so I had a lot of time between scheduling and doing it. I didn't actually, I procrastinated pretty long on actually getting started though. So I think I did about three weeks is when I started to work on it. I would say two weeks is when I started to work hard on it. Uh, the three week mark, I was kind of just reading a little, not much. And honestly, I actually didn't have the final idea until a week before I had to do it, like, I'd hand it in. And, Partially thanks to this committee member right here, actually. Oh, a <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. No, how, I don't. how long did it take you guys? Uh, for what? Like, on average, like, how long did it take you guys to, yes, first come up with a topic and yeah. then, and then uh, getting the work and OP stuff done? So for, yeah, so for, <laughs> so for a general timeline, I would say, like, once you have your OP, like, scheduled, and let's say your OP is the first week, like, October 5th, I'd say you'd want your like slides like mostly done and you can actually run through with older students in your group to polish up those slides like a week before. And then I'd say a week before that you'd want to have pretty much your entire like the actual like, written part of the OP like done for the most part where you're just kind of handing it to people. And I'd say like a little requirement too. I think yeah. Like two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, like, it's, like, it's like a two week, yeah you're required to have stuff from like two weeks or a week or whatever. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, sorry I, and I actually worked up three ideas until like I was like, oh, that's going to fail because of this, that's going to fail because of that, and I can have a lot of dumb puns with this one. So I did that <laughs> one. And the, yeah. when, so when, when was the mark when you narrowed down your final idea? My final idea, so I went October like 24th, and then my final idea I had like by September 15th or something, like halfway through September. Do that, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I personally have high anxiety, so I cannot do what he did. <laughs> it's actually three months before my deadline is when I start reading all the review papers. Two months is my set deadline for like coming up with an idea, and I have two months to write, polish, and give my presentation to my lab mates. And if you need ideas, at least if you're an analytical, and I imagine other divisions work the same, uh, look at trends in analytical chemistry. 
uh, it shows not just specific papers, but it shows like general ideas that are like brand new, that are also kind of like good things to work on. That's new developing. There's more like frontier to clear in that field than something that's already like completely done. I think I should add the PCAM division is a little more lax on the OP in general. So I think it's more typical people will spend a little like a shorter time frame on it in that division than others. That's how I got away with it. Again, not advocating you do that. Don't do that. Yeah, I do a lot of TV, so probably closer to the time than a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a month, I guess, like, like mid September, I had my final idea, and then I turned it in, like, first week of October, and then December. And I guess that actually leads into another very essential question I'm sure everyone's trying to figure out at the moment. How did you find your idea? Like Nick mentioned already, like the trends in analytical chemistry. Um, where did you get the idea from? Like, how did you start looking for things? I think if so, if you're really have no idea and you're kind of worried about coming up with an idea, I'd say just start reading papers about things that interest you. Because it's really painful at first, because you're reading terminology that you have to go Google what every, like, every other word means. But once you get it and you start knowing what the papers mean, you get faster reading them and your ideas will just kind of come. Uh, for me, the reason my topic got narrowed down is because I thought I had an idea months out and I was excited about it and I thought this is great. And then at that two week mark, I learned that my idea had already been done probably 20 years ago. So that was sad. But, uh, um, and that happened. but in all the reading I did for that idea, it took me a while actually to find the paper that basically said what I did was actually kind of a bad idea. They did a better version of whatever. Um, I did so much reading that the new idea came a lot faster. So when you just read a lot of papers, you know, you'll, you'll have ideas and, and they'll just kind of come naturally, I think, because it's, it's like you read their conclusions and there's like, what's next, right? Or what did they miss? And that, that'll just kind of be a, an idea right there. That's where I found mine. I always read the conclusions and then went, there's a deficiency here and we can't do anything about it right now. It's like, ah, I, I'll do it. I think you yeah, you like, <laughs> you'll, you'll get yeah. you'll get really fast at reading them over time, you know, because like the first five papers are so miserably slow, yeah. and then after that you're you get better, you the get better at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really skim more. So, Tom Nicholas, for you guys, just making sure that all the guys know you had were not, you know, like it wasn't something that was already done. Just, like you might find a few weeks before, or maybe even a week before, but sometimes. But Paul wants to look for sign finder. Always look for keywords on there. There's almost all the paper that I ever published is on sign finder. Mm -hmm. um, you have access as producer, so always go on there, look for keywords. You'll be able to find all the papers that relate to your field. Yeah. But just because you find something that's similar in the two from before, it's not like the end of that topic. Like you read the paper and usually there'll be some kind of deficiency or something that they say at the end, like, hey, we could have done this better and then you can just expand on it. Like your topic doesn't have to be like, you know, the cure to cancer. It just needs to be something that is new and something more complicated than that's been done previously. I'd also say there's a balance. So there's two approaches you can go with your OP. You can either go for extremely high novelty, mm -hmm. or you can go for extremely high knowledge base on something that's more kind of recent or more or less been done before that you're kind of just building off of. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing something crazy novelty, like it's really high, you don't have to have as much knowledge necessarily mm -hmm. about it. But if you're doing something that's been more or less done before, but you're kind of taking a new twist or approach on it, you better know what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll read so much about the background of it from several papers that if what you're proposing has been done, you'll very likely find it. So I don't, I don't know if you need to be extra thorough to, to cover that so much. Going back to the question on finding a topic, uh, it's something you're going to spend your life on for like a month or two. And there's such thing as like overworking your OP because if you're not doing lab stuff because mm -hmm. you're working on your OP, you're going to piss off your PI, which isn't a good idea. Um, but if it's something you're going to be looking at like every day for at least like an hour or two or a couple hours, make sure it's something you're interested in. It definitely comes across in your OP as well when you present if you're super interested in it. They're yeah. hard to tell me to go, I like what's in it for this. If you're engaged, they're engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have sort of two shortish questions. Number one, uh, what do you do if a day of your OP, one of your committee members can't make it? 
I think you only need two of three technically for the requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like one should be your PI ideally, but I think you only need two of three. But that's why you schedule three if one. I, 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 somebody check that in the handbook. I, yeah, I, they'll send you if they haven't already. There's like a uh, like a document that they'll send you. It's very vague on the requirements, which is why we have this. Um, but I think that's in that document. Of yeah. How, how many you have to have? And then if two or all three can't make it, then you probably just reschedule uh, for next semester. But that's that's on them. That's not on you. Okay. Yeah. So that's a bad fault. I don't think there's really a deadline so much on it, right? So even if you have to punt it back really far, it's just it's annoying for you. But other than yeah. that, it's it's. Okay. Is there a yeah, yeah, I think first, it's November or something. first semester like before Thanksgiving? Yeah, first semester of your third year. This but there's exceptions. But if it falls yeah. on that model, that's not an issue. And I think there's no deadline. Deadlines are flexible. <laughs> my, my lab mate did it the second semester of third year, actually. So that's I don't know. I thought there's one year old for it. <laughs> 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 Yeah, the second so my second <laughs> question. If you're doing something more physical, so I'm gonna be I'm thinking about doing archaeology on gun flints. Can I do props for like the <laughs> I will recommend right now not bringing gun to campus. <laughs> 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 okay. rocks. I think that's probably fine. Yeah, I don't know if there's any rules on that. Oh, by the way, like we say about like when you're practicing with your like other people in your group and stuff, bring them food. Do not bring food to your OP. Like, you're not giving them a spread or anything. Like, no. Um, it's, you're there for an exam. You don't bring people, like, pizza to an exam. Well, you might, but... Sorry, that was just a quick thing. Yeah, I think that's probably fine. Like, you bring one food, so... <laughs> exactly. Can I schedule, like, during the week or on the weekend? Like, on a Saturday? I think they'll only do during yeah, the week. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Good luck getting up. I was, like, I, was like, I was surprised that yours was past 5 p.m. actually. Yeah. It's just because I know some people did it on the weekends. Really? If you're, I mean, if your committee is down for it, then yeah. sure, but I, I don't know. There's no way I was getting my committee to come in on the weekends. So. Read the room, I guess, if they're okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> they'll do that. Yeah, like, like if you're having trouble, I guess, scheduling them, you could ask them directly in an email, being like, hey, Clearly, we're having trouble coming to an agreement. Like, can we do this on a Saturday or something like that? Um, but again, that's kind of like a last resort decision. Yeah. So, another thing, um, I do think I have a main idea, um, but I do feel like I'm getting a bit sucked into a trap of like going down a literature review path where I'm like, I need to stop. I need to like actually come up with a formal proposal. Um, I would say like. How did you guys prioritize the writing the proposal versus the background? And did you interweave them together, or did you have one that you preferred to tackle before the other? How we were woven were those two aspects? My strategy was pick one step, like one project. You know, it wasn't really the whole grant thing I want to solve. It was just the first part of it, and that's what the proposal is going to be about. So this was kind of think, uh, I don't know, like most projects we're working on, a lot of them will go on to another piece, you know, like you'll, you'll publish a paper about it and you're still working on it because there's more to do. I figured this is kind of like, find, think of a proposal that would be like one paper's worth and then, I don't know, from the, from the idea now of what you actually want to be doing in this fictional proposal, um, then you put the necessary background so people can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. I guess even to like going, like adding to that question, you can still answer your original question. I, like, I guess, how was your thought process, like, I guess, narrowing down your proposal? Because if, even if you started something that's more general, like, I wanted to do drug chemistry, how did you get from big idea to here's the very specific thing I'm working on or wanting to work on in theory? I think I start with the idea first, because I learned the hard way that if you read too many things and you try to do the background first, then it's, everything just get convoluted really fast. So I get just lose my track. So I have to start with an idea. And then from that idea, there's going to be a bunch of background that I can collect that relate to that one idea. So I don't like go off trail to something else. For analytical chemistry, the ultimate questions are what do you have and how much of it do you have? So I actually asked the National Park Ranger, hey, what's, a, what's an issue of something that you like would want to know the amount of or what the thing is? And they said white nose syndrome and bats. So I kind of started with like a, a real world problem, and then I was like, I want to tackle that, and then I read the literature afterwards. So I kind of had an idea beforehand, and that's what I ended up ultimately doing. Yeah. 
I wanted to do, I know I wanted to do like, like chemical and nuclear proximity. That's like a, why it brings like a protect kind of idea. And then I kind of just looked at targets and then like, there was like a science paper that came out like a couple months, like two months before that. So I knew that nobody had that idea. And I was like, I'll work my way into like, and do bringing, it was like a gap for KRAS. So I was like, oh, it just proximity between the gap and KRAS. And then like I met with like professors on campus that that was expertise. And they would be like, ah, but we don't do that. Let's say, like, well, they, they were like, you can't, it's not been proven. It's like, here, do this. Instead of trying to make like an actual like inducer proximity, just move on the deck genetically. So like professors outside the department can help give you an idea. That's a question on here. Yeah. Yeah, like how'd you narrow down your idea? Like I talked to professors. Some of those. My idea at first was huge, very, like, I do computational stuff. So I thought I was on to a really simple, fundamental way to just change how we do it. And I thought it was going to be amazing. And then that was when I found, like, oh, that's, this has been done way better than I ever thought of at first. So in my reading, though, it, without getting too complicated, I wanted to propose a way to model chemical reactivity, with, like, classic, like classical force fields, because since they have trouble with that. Um, so I was reading about specific reactions people try to model, and that's what led me to the ending idea. So it was actually very, very different from what I started reading on. But by reading, I found other ideas as well. That's that's a way to go, I guess. Do you want to narrow down your idea? Like it helps make the background a little smaller, so you're going to reuse it in the middle. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like. I mean, sure. There's a thing. There's too much reading. But also, I think, like, I might have even, I think I spent more time reading than I did actually writing or doing anything. Like, I started, here's the problem, read, read, read a lot, fine, this is a possible solution, read a whole lot about what's being done in that particular field of the solution. And then, like, every single step of, like, picking, okay, this is the type of thing I want to do, I have to read a lot about it. This is the kind of sample prep I want to do, now I have to read a lot about it. I feel like reading a lot, well, you can go down a rabbit hole. It helps you more in the long run if you do a whole lot of reading at the beginning and then write your your proposal because you go into it with a very clear idea of the field. Otherwise, you might kind of lose focus the other way by not knowing what has been done before and what other people have tried. And I think the amount of reading is going to depend on like what Nick was saying, where it's like, is it super, super high novelty, like the whole thing is brand new, or is it I'm combining five different smaller novelties into one, which that was more along the lines of mine. Yours was like every novel, right? Like yeah, it was more novels. So yeah. it's like that's also going to change how much reading you have to do. Because like I had to know very in depth about a lot of my stuff. Like, did you know carbon nano onions are a nano structure? I didn't. Um, but like I had to know a lot about that. Whereas like if it's something a little more like a lot more novel, like you'll need to know not a lot less, but like a little less. Like okay, I'm looking at a lot of new things, so. Um, it'll depend. And of course your level of anxiety too, I think, determines how much you read into it. <laughs> you have plenty of time for questions. I will say, you will have a moment where you like wake up at like 3 in the morning and you're panicked, like in a sweat, being like, oh my god, it's not going to work because of that. And if it turns out, yeah, it's not going to work because of that, that's fine. Like if it's like the day before the OP and it's like you find somebody already did your thing, or it's like there's a better way to do it or something like that. It's not going to be like you should rewrite your whole OP like the night before. I, I think you have to go into your OP saying, hey, I found this thing or this thing like was published like a week ago before I started like doing all the research and stuff. And here's what they look and stuff. But they're, they're not necessarily concerned about what your idea. They're concerned about your thought process working through an idea. That's what they're testing you on. I don't know, they might have said it already because it's been always professors before us, but I remember somebody last year saying to us, nobody has an OP idea that works. And that's okay. <laughs> Just, you know, do your best to make it logical and show that you understand your topic and that you thought through it. Here's one tip that, one second. Here's one tip that I think gonna help benefit a lot of you is that at some point you're gonna find yourself reading 15 different papers just to write two, one or two sentences, and you only can reference like one or two references, so that's really time consuming. And eventually what's gonna happen is when you read all the way to the paper 50, you're gonna forget whatever you read in paper one, so you're gonna remember, oh, I read about that one fact, 
for that one paper. And now I already read 50, so I don't know which one that was. If you have EndNote or any kind of Zotero or any oh, yeah. reference, definitely paraphrase. Paraphrase like around one or two sentences about which information from that paper that you actually need. So when you go back, all you have to do is scan through like 10 different sentences, pick out that one reference instead of rereading 10 different papers. So I think that's going to definitely help a lot of people. On that note, if you don't have a citation manager, yeah. get yes. Mendeley, Zotero, yes. if you want EndNote, sure. Um, it costs money here. What is psychopath? Um, Aaron de Purdue doesn't give you it for free. Anyway. Um, and Aero have one because I don't know if y'all any of y'all remember off the top of your head how many sources you had. I had exactly 50 um, in my written report, so um, it can get up there. Manually citing them is a pain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you say read, I would say, I, so I had like 75 citations, but a lot of them you skim. But, but like most of them you skim, and a lot of it, like, if, if I was like a person reviewing this OP and I click on it and I just read the title, it's like, oh, yeah, that probably is going to cite the thing that they're trying to make the claim on. So like, don't like, you don't even need to highlight mostly, just like, really just, I don't know, I, I, like some papers you definitely have to like go in depth and read and like highlight everything. A lot of papers you can probably skim with the abstract, a couple figures, and the conclusion. Save yourself time. Yeah, I was going to say, um, leading into the you know, mixing product ideas thing, um, another reason why I'm doing so much research is I'm very much paranoid that something about it isn't going to work, and I'm going to find one clause that debunks it. Um, although the point favorite. of this course is not to, you can't ever be one of the it's going to work. Um, did you guys have ideas that didn't work, and how did, and when did you find those, and when did you feel that your project was solid enough that you were comfortable continuing with those? I wouldn't think that order. <laughs> my, my first idea was terrible because it was already done much better, right? It was just a bad idea all around. Um, and I think the new idea came up actually because I remembered sitting in class. And I actually texted her to ask, hey, do you remember this thing we talked about in class? Because there was like a problem the professor mentioned, no one knows exactly how this chemistry happens. And in computation, we love to take things people don't know and then plug it into a computer and pretend that that's exactly how it goes. So I guess it kind of was like a change of approach, right? I had this really fundamental idea I thought was great. Would have been cool. It, it didn't work though. Um, but when I changed the approach and instead had a problem first and that was going for it, that was better. So I think that's... A better way to do it if you can, if it's a problem that interests you. Um, I don't know. I don't know how else to explain that, I guess. It's just with the first idea, I, just reading along, I kind of just realized that what some of the papers I was reading, basically what they got to was what my proposal would have tried to get to conclusion-wise, but I think they did it more thoroughly, and that was, that's when I knew, oh, this is a bad idea. <laughs> this is a terrible OP idea. For me, if you know that it would work, still tell how you're going to solve the problem. So if this doesn't work, don't tell them, like, I know this doesn't work. Just, like, propose a method. If they bring it up, that hey, I don't think this is going to work, like, uh -huh, I have a plan B. So always prepare plan B, if not even plan C. I have three different plans. That's because I'm paranoid. Uh, but always have plan B, like, I know you're going to ask that question, that's an excellent question, and here is my plan B if plan A doesn't work out. So, there's that. Your, your PI will tell you if your thing doesn't work pretty early on, and they'll give it a reason for it, and then you can maybe on the spot try to mm -hmm. work with them to figure out how to get it to work, but... Yeah, okay, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> he was just as surprised as the rest of my community when I walked into my oral presentation. <laughs> they also probably don't read the paper. Like, you're, you're going to write this beautiful, long 20-page document or whatever with all the citations, and they're probably not going to read it. They're probably going through it as a flip book. Like, uh, okay, got Other yeah. than Graham Cooks, he will read, he, like, had, high, he had stuff, like, highlighted, <laughs> underlighted. He had, like, like, notations on it. I'm like, oh, I'm in for a ride. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, they brought my document to my OP and just like run it as I went through it. Like, yeah. they're not, most professors aren't going to read it. And like, that's the same thing. Like, I knew my molecule that I proposed for like, my protag wasn't going to be in the same. So it's like a super peptide strapped onto like another peptide. Like, it's not going to be in the same. It's not going to work. But like, I could prove that it did work next to you all. And then like, 
another product company, like a couple, like probably a month before I presented on my own, because I released a new grill, like disclosure drug. But like, I didn't want to like propose a service for that. Like, I don't know like, I don't know what brand to like, but I don't want to propose a services. So, but they're like, that, like Gene at the end was like, that's not going to get in the cells though. I was like, yeah, that's not a problem, because there's actually this drug. They're like, why don't you propose the drug? And I was like, well, I don't want to propose the synthesis, but it's like, what it looks like. But like, so you're, all, all of these are going to have faults, and they're probably not going to, they're not going to scour the literature like you, right? Like, there's no way. They don't actually care. Whatever appears in like a basic like, search, they might go look at that. Yeah. In like the maybe 10 minutes before your OP, just so they're going to be like, I saw this paper. Um, but other than that, they're not going to go as anywhere in depth as you do. Yeah, like, Gene was like, for 10 minutes, like, so focused on if this peptide had, like, a beta, a beta term. And I was like, I don't really care. I just, I, like, at some point, I hadn't thought, I, like, I just kind of want to move on. It's like, it doesn't matter how it's binding to KRAS, like, it does. One more thing. crystal structure. It's like, yeah. One more thing to add is, when I, uh, I had my first idea that ended up being bad, right? I, I went to one of the committee members. My PI was very hands off. She said, don't talk to me about your OP. I don't want to hear anything about it. But my committee member I went to, and he pointed me in the direction. He didn't really know. They asked him, like, have you heard of this? Has it been done? But he had an idea of where to read. He said, I know, he gave me a name. I don't remember the name now. But he gave me a name of somebody to read about. I said, if you're looking at this, this is this is the guy to read about. And that's what led me down the trail, I guess, to realize it wasn't good. So I'd say definitely reach out to your committee members. I guess you're not supposed to talk to your PI. Some PIs still help you anyway, though. But at least committee members, if not your PI, they, they can point you to what the where to read or what to focus on. It is three o'clock, so if anybody needs to go, by the way, feel free to leave. Um, if anyone just feels like chilling, I'll chill for a little bit if anyone has any additional questions and stuff like that. Um, so let's thank our graduate student panel. They are going to go on to But yeah, if y'all need to go, feel free. Please don't. I have a safety meeting at 530, and then I gotta finish with an annual. <laughs> Yeah. By the way, I don't know this is for you. I'll save it. Try this. No. I didn't get any food. He just moved, so. I really want to talk. I don't want to talk. It's a schedule. 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 Uh, you can use the first paper I tried to read was very early in the middle of the summer, but I wasn't really, it was only a little bit of effort, you know. Once I scheduled it and I put a little more effort into starting to read it, and I would say about a month before I had to turn in the written part, that's when I was like more vigorous to read it and like trying to really come up with the idea, you know. Um, again, though, I went through so many iterations. I went